Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining our session on carbon nanomaterials in medicine. This is the first time we're actually having a bespoke session in CLINAM on the topic. Um, one of the things I have been tasked to uh, do is, uh, apart from chairing the session and discussing with the board and Beat about our speakers and the content we're going to cover, we decided uh, that it will be uh, interesting for the CLINAM audience if I act as the support uh, band for our main acts, uh, which will be uh, our three speakers. So I will give you a kind of a, I'm gonna warm up basically the room for uh, the main scientific content. Uh, and so I will start off with a presentation of about 15 minutes, uh, just to tell you where we stand in terms of um, carbon nanomaterials. So I'm gonna share my, my presentation. Everybody can see it. And yeah, so um, I'm going to give you a very brief uh, historical perspective uh, as to where we stand in uh, the field of carbon nanomaterials and how we have transitioned uh, from one species of uh, nanomaterial to the other. So I think this uh, slide here summarizes uh, where we have been in the last 20 years. Uh, I will place more emphasis uh, in the um, transition from this material, the fullerene, to this material, the graphene sheet, which will be the emphasis of uh, all of our uh, talks uh, today. What I would like to tell you is that we went through this uh, carbon nanotube transition and what another uh, a very important fact is that the uh, whole field of carbon nanomaterials materials has attracted a lot of attention scientifically mainly, but from very different fields, very diverse fields in terms of applications too. So you see uh, a variety of different um, uh, industries adopting the material in at different levels and different product uh, designs. More importantly for scientific um, uh, historical perspective, we have two Nobel prizes that have been awarded in fullerenes and uh, graphene sheets and um, are noted here. So I'll, the next slide is going to give you a uh, brief perspective of where have fullerenes found themselves. So let me start with the first one. So fullerenes uh, look like this uh, under electron microscopy. You see some very, very nice uh, data that has been published in the past. Beautiful electron microscopy data. Um, they are those spherical buckyball structures. And in medicine, they have primarily been explored uh, as these uh, metallofullerene uh, constructs. So caging um, radio metals or other um, metals that are giving us uh, uh, imaging signals. There, there has been some clinical or, or preclinical development. Um, I don't think there's been any clinical uh, study yet. Uh, on these systems, but there have been a, lot, a few preclinical um, studies that are exploring gadolinium-based uh, fullerene, so structures like the ones I'm showing here. But we haven't seen a transition to the clinic, even though this material, as, a, as a, you've seen before, has been the first in the carbon nanomaterial um, family to uh, have been discovered. What has happened, though, is this, which is very interesting. So. For some reason, fullerenes have been quite popular in the cosmetics uh, field. So they are active ingredients um, that or even uh, uh, consist the, um, the list of what's called the COLIPA. So the European uh, Union um, list of cosmetics ingredients. Full, you can find, I think, four or five different types of fullerenes. They're mainly uh, described as antioxidants, uh, free radical scavengers. So you can see them in all of these different um, products. Uh, I'm, I'm only putting um, some examples here. And these are some of the brands and the product specifications that you see on, on the right-hand side. And funnily enough, you see also the Nobel Prize uh, being advertised as part of the packaging of those products, which I always find fascinating. Um, 
then we uh, were confronted with another iteration of carbon nanostructures, these uh, fiber-shaped cylindrical shapes um, uh, called carbon nanotubes. And we have either single walled nanotubes or multi walled nanotubes. They are clearly larger in thickness if you're talking about the multi walled ones. The single walled ones are much, much thinner, but they are much more difficult also to suspend in an aqueous environment. And um, there's been a lot of different types of work that has been done with carbon nanotubes. I'm just going to highlight one um, uh, conceptual. A proposition that we put out many years ago now um, in, in, in our uh, laboratory in collaboration with Maurizio Prato and Alberto Bianco, which was to use those carbon nanostructures as nano needles. And I think conceptually, the important step forward has been this kind of electron microscopy, as we see here, where you see this uh, um, carbon nano um, tube being vertically aligned uh, in relation to the plasma membrane and being able to uh, pierce through and uh, either tag or sense or deliver therapeutic agents. So there's been a, a variety of different um, nano needles. So what I call the uh, appearance of the nano needle. So you see that this work started back in 2004, was published. There was a, a paper in PNAS that I'm showing here on, on molecular dynamic simulation in parallel that was introducing a very similar concept. And then you'll see you have all of those different papers. There are many, many more papers. There are many different laboratories now around the world that are exploring either carbon nanoneedles or uh, different um, uh, chemical consistencies. But in this um, uh, concept of a fiber-shaped nanomaterial that is able to pierce and translocate mammalian and uh, non-mammalian membranes. No clinical development there too. So then uh, about 2004, uh, Kostya here at the University of Manchester published a paper uh, with his, and they uh, described the isolation of these uh, single uh, uh, sheet carbons uh, called uh, uh, graphene. So then the question was, um, and, and that was quite very um, revolutionary uh, in terms of uh, developments, particularly driven by the physics community, where they thought that maybe the whole of the carbon nanomaterial family could originate from graphene. And you see here schematically on the right hand side, how would that be envisioned and how would that be possible? So the question is, are we talking about the prototypical um, carbon nanostructure here in the form of graphene. I guess the physics community has answered the question with all of their thousands of papers and iterations of the unique properties that the material is offering. And uh, the Swedish Academy of Sciences agreed with them by awarding the Nobel Prize in 2010. The question for us as biomedical scientists is, which of these properties that are presented with uh, by, by this uh, sheet of carbon atoms could be interesting and could be translatable clinically. And that would be the essence of this session today. Before I start uh, giving you a more uh, detailed specific flavor of what is it we're going to present to you as a group in, in this session, I just want to highlight, I'm gonna play a video which is more like a um, a, a lay public iteration of what are the unique properties of uh, graphene ma materials and graphene sheets. And then I will highlight how we have decided to take forward some of those properties. So I'll play this video and I will reduce my sound.
think this is a, a, a bit of a, a Hollywood um, interpretation of what uh, physics uh, has considered a Nobel Prize winning uh, technology. But what I'm trying to communicate with this video is that there are a, a, a group of unique properties. Maybe each one of the properties that we've seen depicted in this video, like transparency, flexibility, electrical conductivity, um, corrosion resistance, transfer, uh, flexibility transfer, or easiness to transfer, you can find in other materials, but the combination of those uh, properties is uh, very hard to find by a single structure. So what we've done a few years ago, um, over 10 years ago now, we were deciding which of these unique properties are we going to translate into a meaningful biomedical, uh, hopefully clinical solution. And I'm showing only four here that we've decided to focus on, electrical mobility, flexibility, heat dissipation, and transparency. And if you look at the biomedical uh, use end on the right-hand side, you see the very different um, uh, 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 technologies that we have developed and we are working uh, towards development in order to um, offer solutions to specific clinical problems. There's also another set of properties which is not very commonly discussed, which are the ones in orange at the bottom left uh, on physical interactions uh, uh, with biological barriers. How do these sheets interact with, let's say, the glomerular filtration system, the cardiovascular system, the, 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 the blood-brain barrier, and all of these issues, all of these barriers that are uh, physiologically presented to them. And that, in our view, also presents with opportunities, not only in the pharmacological sense, so using them as transport agents of other therapeutic agents, but also in determining the safety, toxicology, and public health limitations by using these materials or being accidentally and un unintentionally exposed to these materials. So what have we done? We decided that we're going to transform the circle into a brain and apply these properties and these combinations of properties for brain disease. And that was the kind of uh, unique proposition, if you wish, of our research program um, uh, in, in the European Commission um, in uh, um, 2012. So today, we decided to give you a flavor of two areas and two particular technologies with three talks. Um, one uh, area that we are uh, working with, um, a few of us, in the last uh, seven, eight years in the context of the graphene flagship that has been funding this work, is how to uh, use uh, two-dimensional nano sheets made of, car of, of graphene, made of carbon, in neurophysiology. And this is based on our uh, very thorough um, uh, development of uh, sheets like the ones I'm showing in this slide. These are graphene oxides that what we call biologically relevant or medical grade, very thin, small. You can control the lateral dimension, control the, th the thinness or thickness of the material, and most importantly, make sure that all of the batches that we are generating are identical one to the other. So move towards as industrial and medical grade as possible and use such material to explore exactly what we set out with Kostya Novoselov uh, back in 2013-14 when we published this kind of um, perspective um, article, biological entities, biological um, components. So what we're going, what we have um, um, focused on is uh, how do those graphene oxide nanosheets interact with neurons? And I think that is the best launching pad for uh, Laura's uh, presentation. So Laura is going to talk about all of these interactions and in much more detail and actually much better scientifically than what I would ever possibly do. So I'll leave it at that and Laura is going to pick it up in the talk that follows this one. The second area I we're going to highlight is on using graphene uh, in order to design and, and fabricate neural interface devices. So a quite different space that I think CLINAM traditionally is not covering. So I think it's also important to understand that device fabrication and device usage in clinical medicine is also a, an important aspect of 
uh, nanomedicine and translation of nanotechnology into the clinical space. So what we've done here is basically we have we are taking uh, graphene um, uh, iterations and graphene sheets of different types. We are uh, embedding them into these substrates, as you can see here in the schematic, and we are allowing them to interface with the um, central or peripheral nervous system. We're using thin film technology to uh, uh, perform this kind of fabrication. And you'll see here how flexible the devices are. And most importantly, what kind of grids we are able to achieve in terms of mapping um, density and contact density. And this is one of the step forward that we think this technology and this graphene material can offer. So we can have now many many different iterations of these devices. Uh, we have all of them are flexible. Some of them are designed for uh, what we call epicortical um, uh, applications, and some others are designed for deep structure applications. So those that you're, uh, you would want to surgically implant deeper into the central or peripheral nervous system. And in terms of clinical translation that I know is one of the features and one of the concerns of uh, CLINAM, I, I, would, I have two, two lessons here. Clinical translation 1.0 uh, is to, in order to do that, you need to launch a startup in order to, un, to industrialize and take to the clinic. So we did that with this startup company called Inbrain Neuroelectronics. We've raised, we're lucky enough to raise during the pandemic a, a lot of funding in order to be able to do the second task, which is clinical translation 2.0, which is to launch a clinical product, a clinical program of development. And we are running, uh, as we speak, the first in human study that I'm showing you here with those devices. Uh, this is a flexible grid that you see here. This is going to be in contact with the human brain uh, during an on-table glioblastoma resection um, uh, surgery. And these are the specifications of our, of our grids. And um, here on the right-hand side, you can see the um, uh, sponsors of the clinical trial that is currently ongoing. I have to say and leave it at that, that this is the first in human study with any graphene device that has ever been done. So it's quite an important uh, milestone, I think, in the development of the carbon nanomaterial um, in medicine space. I will leave you with this schematic from our vision uh, um, from our vision document a few years ago, which was how would graphene-based um, neural interface devices make a difference? And the idea behind this and all of the designs of the devices I've showed you is that we can perform multiple functions. The concept of multifunctionality is extremely important in this business. And we think that this is one of the competitive advantages that the material is offering. So again, as part of my um, warm up act, I am highlighting that we have Professor Serge Picot from Paris Vision Institute, who's going to uh, discuss and describe to us some uh, uh, data uh, that will include also stimulation of the of, of, of the central nervous system component uh, in order to improve vision. And we also have Dr. Rob Weix from uh, UCL, from the Institute of Neurology, um, uh, who is going to discuss about, uh, and the University of Manchester, of course, who's going to talk about uh, recording and how we use those devices in order to record for um, uh, the purposes of um, uh, ep epileptogenesis and detecting epileptogenesis better and in higher fidelity. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. And I think with that, I will um, um, stop sharing and pass on to Professor Ballerini, who is our first main speaker. Laura. Yes, thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much, Costas. I wish to thank also the organizers and Costas in particular for not only for this uh, uh, fabulous uh, uh, synthesis and perspective on uh, graphene materials, but also for 
um, organizing this symposium and uh, offering me the opportunity to participate today and addressing these uh, uh, carbon nanomaterials toolbox for medicine and potential applications. Now, in my presentation, I will um, report about novel and outstanding carbon uh, based nanomaterials uh, with uh, uh, outstanding properties and their ability to um, interface and they're using interface in neuronal networks and neurons and they're also um, potentially in uh, uh, affecting neuronal functional properties thus representing somehow unconventional uh, tools to govern genuine uh, biological processes. In particular, as uh, um, um, anticipated by Costas, I will, I will focus on uh, small graphene oxide flakes and their ability to interface subcellular uh, structures, thus affecting um, neuronal functioning, which are fundamental, such as, uh, for example, uh, synapses. Now, as you all know, synapses are uh, computing and transferring information among neurons and neuronal networks, and they connect neuronal networks, and they are the basis for brain operations. And um, graphene uh, represents a two-dimensional materials, which is, uh, as uh, illustrated by Constas, uh, which is most and most developed towards uh, several applications in uh, science and technologies, including biomedical applications in neurology and in neuroscience. Now, what we have done has been to um, address the impact of uh, nanomaterials and in particular of graphene in this case on neuronal signaling and so we were the first to demonstrate that uh, uh, graphene oxide flakes are able to interface uh, subcellular neuronal compartments and thus it can modulate and impact the nature of connectivities and therefore of neuronal networks. I will describe here how small graphene oxide um, nanosheets, which are will be abbreviated from now on as SGO, interact selectivity with excitatory synapses in the mammalian brain, so with a specific category of synapses. And this modulation of glutamatergic mediated neurotransmission, that is excitatory transmission, can be translated from in vitro to in vivo, uh, in vivo settings. Now, the simplest uh, setting where to test the effect of a small graphene oxide flakes, SGO, in neuronal networks and in synaptic networks particularly, is that of cultured neurons, as shown in here. These immunofluorescence images are uh, illustrated hippocampal neurons, which were isolated from postnatal rats and then maintained in vitro for days or weeks. Now, hippocampal neurons in this condition could be, could be exposed, and this was the very first set of experiments several years ago, to graphene oxide flakes, to SGO, for a prolonged period, in this occasion for six days. Upon six days of exposure, we evaluated that uh, uh, neurons, uh, cultural neurons, um, did not uh, were not affected in terms of morphology or survival. Here are visualized in red by markers of specific cytoskeletal component, and were not affecting also the uh, numbers of neurons, their survival, the network size. But after six days of exposure to low doses, uh, SGO10 stays for uh, 10 microgram per ml for six days, the activity, the population activity of the network, which here is illustrated by live calcium imaging, was drastically reduced as indicated by these fluorescent tracings, where the peaks are calcium events, which are uh, synchronous calcium events in the network in different neurons simultaneously recorded. And this is how they were reducing frequency after the exposure to SGO. This was also the, the ability of SGO to inter, inter, interfere somehow in synaptic activities also highlighted in here. These are single cell uh, patch clamp recording at the voltage clamp mode from control neurons and SGO exposed one in the presence of tetrotoxin. That is with the removal, pharmacological removal of action potential. These are miniature postsynaptic currents and observing miniature synaptic currents allows to estimate um, modifications in terms of structure and morphology of synapses. Now, the reduction in frequency was a clear indication that after six days exposure without changes in the amplitude of the events, they were effective at the, at the, presynaptic, at the presynaptic site, either in the um, uh, efficiently releasing neurotransmitter, the probability of release, or in the number of synapses or other features. 
Now, if we want to translate this very initial finding into the ability to use SGO to target excitatory synapses, since one of the evidence is that this effect was only restricted to excitatory synapses, at least in vitro, we need to understand if this effect is direct, if there is a direct interaction of SGO with the presynaptic membranes, for example, and if SGO is um, modifying what are um, a, a, the sensor machinery for synaptic release, which is the endoexocytosis trafficking of vesicles. To understand this issue, we design experiments using always the same material, the one mentioned by Costas before, which are small graphene oxide flakes at the medical grade that is uh, uh, characterized by SEM or by AFM, atomic force microscopy, with a clear dimension and a reproducible dimension with a Raman spectra, for example, and other features. And we've always used this material, which was provided and characterized in the laboratory of Professor Costarelos. And we have used that in different settings. The first one is the one you've seen before, cultural neurons and patch clamp neurons. And the design of the experiments was to understand from the mechanistic point of view what SGO was, in, what was the impact of SGO on synapses. So the very first setting of experiment is sketching here. In that case, uh, a, a, a pipette is, is positioned in close uh, proximity to the recorded neuron, patch clamp, single patch clamp neurons, and the delivery of silent solution or silent solution containing SGO is uh, done for a brief uh, application of 500 milliseconds uh, directly on the synapse we want to investigate. And then miniature postsynaptic current and miniature excitatory postsynaptic current, glutamatergic synapses, are investigated prior and after this application. And it is, it is, it is noted in this uh, plot summarizing this data, SGO uh, temporarily augment the frequency of miniature excitatory postsynaptic current, which then goes back to the control. Uh, while the amplitude is not affected, and again, here is not shown, but inhibitory ones were not affected. Now, these transient changes in the frequency of uh, miniature EPSCs, excitatory postsynaptic current, suggest that there is a direct interference of SGO with the presynaptic release machinery. Now, uh, this direct interference is uh, related to the dimension of the flakes used. In fact, when we adopted um, larger graphene oxide sheets, this LGO, which is about two micron in peak dimension, or ultra small, which are about 40 nanometers in peak dimension, no effect on the excitatory uh, synaptic transmission were detected. So in this case, it's, not, it's really the dimension of the flakes which interferes with the specific synapses in a specific manner. Now, our proposal was that SGO, thanks to the dimension and the property of the material, uh, get into the presynaptic release machinery. And the reason why down-regulated glutamate transmission on the long term is due to a glutamate depletion at the presynaptic site. And these start with the forced release of vesicle, which is the reason for the uh, transient increase in miniature EPSB's uh, frequency, which then uh, a long time are down-regulated. Now, this uh, uh, ability um, is uh, linked to the possibility to uh, alter the um, to alter the probability of release uh, at the presynaptic site, and the probability of release can be measured experimentally by performing a simultaneous. Um, a recording of pairs of neurons which are monosynaptically connected. In this case, we patch clamp two neurons, so a couple of neurons which were connected by GABA-A inhibitory uh, receptor-mediated um, transmission, and the other one, uh, the other pair of neurons which was uh, uh, mediated by uh, glutamate AMPA receptors transmission. In that case, we induce a pair of stimuli at high frequency, 20 or 30 hertz, as shows in here. These are GABAergic current, which were characterized pharmacologically by their kinetics and other features. And these are glutamatergic one in this example. Now, if we compute the ratio between the peak amplitude of these two currents, we obtain what is called the peripulse ratio and a per pulse ratio, which is below one, is indicative of a high probability of release at a certain synapses. Um, the other way around, when you have a per pulse ratio, which is above one, is usually indicative of a low probability of release. Now, GABAergic synapses upon per pulse, five millisecond treatment with SGO 
by local pressure ejection as the one you have seen before. And there are no changes highlighted also in here uh, among the period pulse ratio. While in glutamatergic one, exactly the same setting and the same experiments with a 500 millisecond local ejection of SGO, turn a synapse with a high probability of release into a synapse with a low probability of release. And the presence of SGO at the synapse was also detected by taking a, a sort of snapshot, uh, fixing the culture after treatment with SGO. And then this is a control and this is the SGO treated going to the confocal microscopy and um, validate their localization at the synapse by um, co-expression or co-localization uh, of SGO visualized by the reflection mode of the confocal microscopy and bassoon, which is a um, the markers of uh, presynaptic uh, uh, terminals, which is uh, highlighted in this higher magnification. Now, the ability of SGO to target glutamatergic synapses to reach and act at the presynaptic site may be a completely uh, artifact of cultural system where the tissue is not anymore there. There is no neuropil, there is no uh, tissue where to penetrate and the structure of neurons is extremely accessible. So we decided to move to a slightly more complex model, which is represented by acute still in vitro model, acute hippocampal slices, which are isolated from uh, neonatal rats, which are about 400 micron thickness. And the experimental setting is exactly the same as before. We patch clamp a single neuron um, a, as shown in here, and we localize in proximity of the patch clamp neuron a pipette containing either saline solution or saline with SGO. And then we press reject for again 500 milliseconds. The recording shown in here is a spontaneous synaptic activity. These are the excitatory postsynaptic currents. And again, the ability of SGO to transit increase the frequency is shown also here, while the inhibitory postsynaptic currents shown in here were not affected. So we replicate selectivity of the effect of SGO in a condition in vitro in which the, the tissue is much more uh, complex. Um, now, if our hypothesis holds true, uh, this transient increase upon a prolonged exposure to SGO would be followed by a downregulation of the synapse. Indeed, in vitro, when we perform a prolonged exposure here, at the bar in red, as usual, up to six hours with the SGO and at the usual low concentration, there is a progressive reduction in the frequency of these events. So this indicates or hints at the fact that actually the mechanism is the one we have suggested. We decided, therefore, that it was time to step to the real thing, that is to uh, test whether in vivo we obtain similar results in terms of uh, uh, affecting excitatory synapses. So we work this time on slightly older animals. These are juvenile rats, young, young old adults, juvenile rats, in which we stereotactically injected um, the saline solution or the saline solution with the SGO, one microliter containing 50 microgram uh, in that case, in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus of one hemisphere. Then we wait for 48 hours. And after 48 hours and 72 hours in some samples, we uh, isolated the hippocampus slices, so ex vivo preparation, from the treated and untreated hemisphere. So the contralateral is untreated one without the surgery, the uh, saline injected and the SGO injected, and we patch clamp directly neurons measuring the excitatory postsynaptic current again. As shown down in here, in this bar plot, Contralateral and silent treated behave in a similar fashion at 48 and 72 hours. Either there has been the surgery or not, is not affecting significantly the um, frequency of uh, postsynaptic currents. Why SGO at 40 day hours uh, significantly reduce the frequency of current, and in particular, again, specific to excitatory postsynaptic current, so specific affecting glutamatergic uh, transmission. And these um, reduction is reversible after 72 hours. So there is an effect at 48 hours, which is reversed. There is a transient effect on glutamatergic transmission, which is observed in vivo by applying SGO. We further uh, documented in this work the presence of uh, uh, graphene oxide at the site of injection along with different time. This was done coupling uh, bright field image microscopy with uh, confocal Raman maps as shown in here. And again, a 72 hours 
post injection, we couldn't detect the presence of uh, uh, graphene uh, oxide flakes, the SGO, um, in the site of injection. We also estimate the um, diffusion of the material in respect to the sites of injection by coupling um, SGO with quantum dots and again visualizing the presence in the site of injection, which illustrates how they um, more or less localize close in close proximity to the site uh, where they were uh, delivered directly. Uh, we also estimated that at 48 hours, when there is a drop in the uh, glutamatergic transmission, there are no clear reduction in the amount of presynaptic bassoon positive uh, um, staining in the tissue, as shown in here, while um, comparing saline again and SGO after 48 hours. And we also estimated, so there were no difference in the amount of bassoon positive um, uh, terminals in the two prep. And we also estimated the tissue reactivity to the application of these uh, uh, of SGO. Uh, there is a tissue reactivity due to the surgery, of course, but we co compared those of silent solution and SGO at the site of injection at a different distance. And we evaluated the astrogliosis, GFIP positive cell reactivity, or the IBA1 uh, positive one, which is the microglia. In these uh, bar plots, uh, the injection site is compared with the lateral and medial area of the same hippocampus that was isolated and in green in silent and in blue is SGO. And what is uh, to note here is that the reactivity not only is not improved by uh, SGO, is not different, the tissue reactivity to the injection of the material, but actually 48 hours, there is a significant reduction in tissue reactivity in SGO. And at 72, there is a significant reduction again in terms of microglia. Um, in this uh, in this preparation, thus um, SGO targets uh, the glutamate release at the presynaptic site. We presume we understood more or less the mechanism. Is a transient effect? Is a transient down regulation of glutamatergic transmission? So we wonder whether this transient down regulation of glutamatergic uh, transmission at specific site in the brain in vivo might. Um, uh, um, impair the development of uh, uh, pathological processes such as dysfunctional synaptic plasticity. Now, synaptic plasticity, as you all know, is dynamic changes in the synaptic function, which is crucial to a complete physiological process such as learning and memory. But more recently, some dynamic changes in a, a glutamatergic synapses has been involved in dysfunctional plasticity, which is at the base of uh, uh, symptoms which appears in several brain diseases such as anxiety disorders. In particular, in anxiety disorders, in the amygdala, uh, complex in the lateral amygdala, uh, glutamatergic synapses undergo a hyperexcitability um, wind up, which is a sort of long term potentiation of synapses, which has been connected to the storage of uh, adversive memory, uh, which is uh, um, at the base of a stressful, uh, which is at the base of enabling post traumatic stress disorders after stressful events, PTSD. So we use a RAD model of uh, uh, an anxiety disorders uh, of a PTSD disorder, which is based on the exposure of the animal to an adverse stimulus, which is the odor of a predator, is a cat odor. And after the exposure, if the animal, uh, of course, will immediately activate uh, an innate uh, uh, protective fear response. And this uh, uh, avoidance response is maintained when the animal is re-exposed to the context, not to the stimulus, uh, up to six or eight days after uh, the only exposure. This behavior, the maintenance of this behavior, is a sort of uh, indicators of the uh, buildup of, of PTSD disorders and is linked to the Mm, consolidation of plasticity as glutamatergic synapses in the lateral amygdala. Therefore, we use uh, this uh, uh, indicates the uh, fear response, uh, which is quite uh, um, intuitable. So we use uh, a, a group of animals in which uh, this response was uh, activated. The control were not exposed, of course. We injected in the lateral amygdala after one day upon exposure, the SGO or the silent solution. And then we investigated after six or eight days whether the behavior related to the PTSD was still 
maintained or not. This was done by uh, quantifying, as shown in here, the time spent in the animal in the uh, avoidance behavior uh, upon re-exposure. And as it is shown in here, there is this huge difference which is significant between saline exposures or SGO uh, injection in the lateral amygdala. What is interesting to note, which is here is the statistic report for all the experiment, if the injection of SGO is outside the lateral amygdala, this effect is not, uh, was not observed. So it's specific to a certain site and presumably to the fact that there is a downregulation of the potentiation of glutamatergic synapses. This was further confirmed by using a more specific test for um, anxiety behaviors, which is represented by the elevated plus maze, where uh, it is evaluated whether the animal uh, spontaneously moves in the open arms of this maze. And these, the animals which is undergoing an, an anxiety disorder, the PTSD, is not visiting quite often the open arms, and this is the condition with the SGO. Uh, with the SGO treated, which fortified the difference that we have been <clears throat> observing. Now, our experiments therefore suggest that um, SGO nanoflakes uh, are specifically target um, glutamatergic synapses and that their action uh, as modulators of synapses is reflected into a modulation of behaviors when uh, their effect is timely placed with uh, changes in this uh, synaptic activity. In the case of this anxiety disorder, the model was chosen to investigate their ability to um, uh, affect aberrant glutamatergic transmission. So this interference with uh, plasticity is an interesting point to start with uh, developing SGO as a perfect factor for targeting glutamatergic synapses. And with this, I would like to close by thanking the people uh, involved in this study from my lab, and from uh, uh, Professor Costarella's laboratory and from Alberto Bianco laboratory regarding the uh, quantum dots conjugate. Thank you very much for your attention. I will stop sharing now. Thank you, Laura. Um, brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. I, I just want to remind everyone of our attendees that uh, they, I, I guess they are not trained after the third day of uh, cleanup that uh, they can either post questions to our speakers uh, on um, <clears throat> in writing, or they can keep their questions for our uh, uh, Q&A session at the end of this um, presentation. Um, at, the, at the end of our presentation, we're all going to move into a debate room. So they can either uh, ask our speakers, uh, including myself, uh, any questions they may have, in this uh, debate room or uh, post the questions um, uh, here. So I've, I've checked the, the chat and uh, I do not see any questions uh, uh, posted uh, for you, Laura. Um, maybe we can, I have a couple of questions uh, just to get you started on, on, our, on, on your views about how to translate this, but maybe we can discuss this in the debate room when we uh, convene. Let me move on to our to our next uh, speaker, our second speaker, um, Professor Serge Picot. Uh, Serge is the director of the Paris Vision Institute, and he will describe to us some of the applications uh, of uh, the device in the context of vision restoration. So, Serge, whenever you're ready to share, please do. Yeah, so thank you very much, Costas, for the introduction. So the idea is we want to restore vision in blind patient. And so I will try to show you what we have uh, done currently uh, to use graphene electrodes in order to improve uh, our retinal prosthesis. So first, just a few words, just to mention that uh, losing sight uh, is what is uh, inducing uh, a very high handicap uh, and maybe the, the worst, because you're not only losing sight, but you're also losing autonomy. And it's something that is the most feared. 
And we, you see that uh, in the next 30 years, uh, the number of blind people will double and also the number of visually impaired will triple. And this is simply due uh, to the fact that we have many aging, uh, we have many disease affecting uh, the population during aging, like age-related macular degeneration or glaucoma. So <clears throat> as you can see here, uh, in the retina, you have several cells, you have the photoreceptors, and you have inner retinal neurons uh, that process the information and send it to the brain. In, in the eye, there's a special area, which is the fovea. You see in the fovea, you have only photoreceptors so that the image is high quality. And so this means that uh, uh, all the other neurons are pushed on the side. And we have different disease, disease affecting the photoreceptors as age-related macular degeneration, others affecting uh, the retinal ganglion cell that send the information to the brain, like glaucoma. So what we wanted to, to develop at the Vision Institute is different uh, therapies affecting the different process. But what I would like to show you today is uh, what we have done with visual prosthesis. When patients are blind, can we recover some vision? And so for retinal prosthesis that we developed, there are when patients are losing photoreceptors, can we introduce an implant, either subretinal or epiretinal, to stimulate electrically this remaining retinal circuit. And so these are especially dedicated to patients with age, either age-related macular degeneration or retinitis pigmentosa people. In age-related macular degeneration, patients are losing central vision. In retinitis pigmentosa, they're first losing peripheral vision and then unfortunately also this central vision. So these patients were the one that were first uh, included in the clinical trials with such an implant, where you see that you have uh, goggles making images that are sent to a small uh, processor, and these send then uh, code the image into electrical signal. These electrical signal are then sent to this uh, small chip here in a box, and they generate current that can go to the electrodes. And this electrode array is attached on the retina and you have 60 electrodes. You see the patient can find a, a small square on the screen and this is highly reliable. You see it finds very well the square when the system is on, not when the system is off, of course. But this is uh, limited vision. And uh, as you can see with only 60 electrodes, uh, you cannot recognize faces. So the idea was to increase the number of electrodes. And in Germany, uh, this retinal implant was generated with more than 1,500 1, electrodes. But unfortunately, the vision was not much more. Only a very few patients were able to read letters. So we, want, we may wonder why. And the idea is that uh, <coughs> in this system, you have electrodes and the current has to return to a ground, a distant ground. And you see that the current level is quite low uh, between the stimulated area and the neighboring area. And it was proposed by uh, our colleague, uh, Blaise Hiver, that if we have uh, the electrode surrounded in a ground grid like this, you can really increase the difference between the stimulated area and the neighboring area. And this will highly depend on the conductivity of the ground grid. And you immediately understand where I will go, because of course, what we would like to do is to use for these electrodes and the ground grid, graphene electrodes that are highly conductive. But first, let me show you the recent data that we had uh, with a new device where we have a ground grid electrode. And so this was designed by Daniel Parenka at Stanford. And you see here the central electrode, a photodiode here in red, and in the surrounding, the green here that goes all around the units is uh, the ground grid. You see this system, there's no wire. It's just a silicon piece, and it is introduced below the retina. 
The first thing that Daniel Parenka did was to put a blind retina in such a recording system and the, the, the device on top of it and shining infrared light, oops, he was able to show that then he can elicit spikes into uh, the retinal ganglion cells. And he could even record in vivo by shining light onto the device and recording the activity on the brain and to show that in fact the visual equity is not very far from the natural vision, uh, visual equity of the rats. So at this point, we decided that we want to bring this to clinical trial. And it's why we uh, produce this in, uh, in France and uh, in a clinical grade. So many things were changed compared to what was done before. And uh, <clears throat> so we decided to test them again, but this time because we want to go to clinical patient, uh, to patients, we tested them on a human primate because the cells are different. And so we wanted to make sure that we can stimulate human cells. So what we did was to take a piece of retina, ex vivo, and as we have no blind primate, what we did was to cut the retina in thickness so that we would get a blind retina. And then in such a recording chamber as first shown, we could record the activity of the retina ganglion cell while stimulating with an infrared light the implant, which will activate the electrode. So using this uh, device, we could show that indeed we are able to induce spikes in uh, retina ganglion cell of the non human primates, but also uh, we were able to isolate the spikes and uh, attribute them to single cell and you can see here the single cell response. And you see that only pixel 60 was able to increase the spiking rate of this ganglion cell, meaning that it was only this pixel that was able to activate the cell and not the surrounding one, showing that we had a high equity with this type of device. So then we went in vivo, and you can see here the implant below the retina of a non-human primate. And because this implant is separating the retina on the top here from the choroid be below, the photoreceptors here in green are degenerating at the position of the implant. And so we could design a test where we would present a central spot to the animal and then a peripheral spot, and we would ask the animal to generate a saccade to, toward the peripheral spot to tell us that he has seen. And so he was able to generate saccade in all direction of sight, except at the position of the implant. But if we stimulate an infrared, you see that the animal is generating a visual saccade. So it's possible here to uh, induce vision in this animal with infrared. You see that it's not seeing in infrared as well. So we were able also to show that it was sufficient to stimulate one single unit of the implant to elicit such a visual response. So these implants are now in clinical trial, and you see here the implant at the back of the eye, and then we can see uh, the infrared light that is shine on the, on the retina, and you see patient uh, can read with this type of uh, device. So these patients have age-related macular degeneration, they recover a visual acuity that is 20 over 460 or 20 over 565, they can fuse the, the prosthetic vision and the natural vision. So from this, we decided that if we want to improve further the visual acuity of patient, we need to develop new device and especially to increase the conductivity of the electrode undergone green. And it's why we developed the graphene project together with our colleague, Costas, Jose Garrido, and uh, Xavier Hila. So the first thing that we tested was, can we stimulate, uh, can we record with such a graphene electrode? And you see here, we have designed some uh, device with graphene electrodes, and we could put it on the eye and record uh, while we flash light, what we call an electroretinogram, and show that uh, during degeneration, we have a reduced size of such uh, electroretinogram. 
So this was the first thing. The interesting thing is that these electrodes, when we compare them to gold, these electrodes are completely translucent. So they will not um, um, uh, prevent the light from going to the retina, which is a big advantage. Another advantage is that we can have several electrodes on the device so that we can record a kind of a multifocal uh, electrode on this array. And you see that we could design different types of arrays so that we could record uh, in different areas the electroretinogram. So this was the first thing that to show that we can record signal uh, with this uh, system, but can we stimulate? So in order to do this, we did uh, we, we first, oh, just before, uh, the, the idea is that uh, if we use this uh, device uh, for recording, we need to make sure that they are safe and they are completely uh, biocompatible. It's why we, we introduced, in fact, such a graphene electrode below the retina of a, a blind animal. And you see here, we can follow uh, with different timing uh, the, the retina and the, the, whether it's still uh, correctly attached to the device. And here, measure the number of reacting uh, cells, especially the microglial cells, and then uh, quantify this microglial cell and show that, in fact, the graphene is very close to the retinal, the control retina. And so we have just a difference due to the fact that we introduce uh, an implant, but the, the difference between the control retina is not significant. So we were very happy to show that these materials are completely uh, biocompatible. Uh, so we can use them for recording and be in a safe condition. The next thing is that if we want to, to record, uh, so we tested the, if we, if we want to stimulate the retina, the blind retina, we first tested, can we uh, stimulate neurons with this type of graphene electrode. So what you can see here, we did put here uh, the, the design, the, the retina, the isolated retina on such an electrode array. The electrode were graphene electrodes, so we could record spikes, you see. So we can not only record large uh, electroretinal line signals, but we can also record single spikes, as you can see here. And then, so we can see that when we shine light, we have the classic increase in spiking frequency of the ganglion cells. But also here, when we uh, shut down the light, we have also this increase in spiking frequency. It's really uh, the activity of neurons because we can block it here with some synaptic blockers. And so then what we show here on this uh, recording is that if we uh, stimulate electrically here, and you see the artifact of stimulation, we can induce spikes into the retinal ganglion cell, meaning that we are not only able to record the spikes, but we can electrically stimulate the retina, the isolated retina, such that we will elicit a spike into the ganglion cell. So this was the first result that uh, enabled us to, to go further. And we decided that we, we want to see uh, whether we can have a more complex design. And it's why we then uh, introduced uh, uh, reduced graphene oxide electrodes. So the idea is that if we want to stimulate uh, safely, we need to have a higher developed uh, structure so it's why we had these uh, special uh, electrodes. And you see here that we were, we again put the electrode with this uh, special electrode below the retina. We could follow them uh, during a long period of time, not only with these uh, iPhone, these images, but also with this kind of section of the retina in vivo. So this is a long-term follow-up. And uh, so we did this, and we compare not only uh, this graphene with uh, just a polyimid uh, structure, but we compare it also to platinum electrode. And <clears throat> you see here, above the electrode, we can count uh, 
the microglial cell again. We can model them to really be sure that we count individual cells and then compare this number of cells here. And you see that uh, compare, I mean, as contrast to the control. And here we have the polyimide, here the platinum electrode, and the, here the graphene electrodes. And you can see that, in fact, there is no uh, significant difference between all these conditions, especially you see here polyimide is classically considered to be uh, biocompatible. And so with our uh, graphene electrode, we have a similar counting. So it means that the graphene is not introducing any uh, uh, incompatibility uh, to, the <coughs> to the tissue. And so we also counted the volume of the cell, because we know when there's a reaction, the volume of a microglial cell is increasing. And you see here, when we compare the control with the graphene electrode, that we have no uh, statistically different uh, uh, measure. So this was quite interesting, because it means that the graphene electrode are really safe. Uh, we can go into in vivo condition and see whether we can now stimulate with this uh, electrode. So what we did was to introduce uh, such uh, an implant, but this time it was connected so that we could stimulate the in vivo electrode. So here, as you can see here, so we introduce this uh, uh, multi -ele electrode array below the retina of a, of a rat. And so the, the implant was fixed on the head so that we could connect a stimulator. And then in order to measure the response of the retinal cell, we went to the, to the colliculus, to the superior colliculus. And you see here, so this is what we call uh, functional ultrasound imaging. It's a, a technology that is quite similar uh, to MRI, but we have a much better resolution, uh, but we need to remove the skull. And you see here that when we shine light onto the retina, we have a response in the uh, superior colliculus. And when we stimulate with the different electrode, you see we have different size of electrode, 25 micron, 50 micron, or 100 micron, we were able to elicit response in the superior colliculus. And these are preliminary results, but it's very interesting because you see that even with 25 micron electrode, we have a really a strong response, which was even greater than the 100 micron electrode. So with this, uh, I think I, I want now to, to conclude, uh, to show that uh, we can restore uh, vision in blind patient. And this was achieved in a patient with retinitis pigmentosa or age-related macular degeneration. But uh, the best visual acuity was uh, measured with Prima that we tested in France. And so you see that the patient are recovering a vision close to legal blindness, close to one over 20. So we need to increase further because we want to get them a real uh, high equity vision. And so this is what we aim to do with graphene electrodes. So we first showed that we can use the graphene electrode for recording an uh, electroretinogram. Uh, we can record spikes with this graphene electrode. With the reduced graphene oxide electrode, we can use them for stimulation in vivo. We have shown that graphene is completely biocompatible. Sorry. <coughs> and also reduce graphene oxide electrode. So for the future, we need to show that if we introduce such graphene electrode on a clinical grade retinal implant, we can induce vision uh, with this new uh, device. So with this, I just want to mention my colleague, especially Jose Sael, who is a clinician and has been uh, always pushing into the direction for restoring vision. And my colleague, Julie Zhang, who tested all the recent graphene electrodes, and uh, <coughs> uh, Diep Nguyen, 
And Paul Henri Prevost tested the, the primate, did the primate study. And this was done with our colleague at ECN2, and especially Jose Garrido, and also at CIBER uh, with Xavier Illa. So, with this, uh, I need to thank the Graphene flagship because uh, they allowed us to go to this uh, uh, very nice development, and it was important for us to be able to achieve this. So we see something. Uh... Brilliant. Thank you, Serge. Very impressive clinical work. Um, I suggest because we're so perfect in timing to move on to Rob's uh, talk. And then I checked also on the chat, uh, there's no questions for us. Um, so if we move on to our third uh, presentation for the session, the talk will be given by Dr. Rob Wikes, who is at the Institute of Neurology at the University College London and at the um, University of Manchester. Here with us, he's running the uh, Nano Neuro team. He's going to talk to us about using those devices for epilepsy. Rob. Okay, thank you very much, Costas, for the introduction. And also, thank you very much to the organizers of the conference for allowing me to give this, this talk today. So as Costas um, mentioned, I'm going to be giving a talk about how we're using graphene-based electrophysiological probes to understand um, more about the epileptic brain and um, really understand more about the mechanisms underlying seizure generation, uh, propagation and termination, but also what the potential therapeutics and clinical applications for this technology could be. So I'll start with a, with a very um, basic overview slide. And, and just to really point out that um, brain signals can be active over a very wide um, range of, of frequencies, bandwidths, if you like. And typical clinical um, electrical um, recording systems, but also the majority of preclinical recording systems, focus in on what we call a local field potential, which is brain rhythms or brain oscillations that are going somewhere between 0.1 up to about 80 hertz, which means they're going either one-tenth of a second or, or, or up to about 80 times a second. And there's obviously a lot of important brain activity that is captured within the, that frequency range. But in recent years, and in particular in the field of epilepsy, we know that there are biophysical markers, electrographic markers, that occur in frequencies that are higher than this. Um, these include um, ripples, high gamma, and also high frequency oscillations, but also very important um, markers that can occur below this range, which we call ultra slow oscillations or direct current shifts. And really um, one of the major limiting factors for both preclinical and clinical um, research studies at the moment is the absence of experimental tools that would allow us to record all the way from direct current up to high frequency oscillations and map these signals um, across the brain using a, a single device. Um, so the current technology that is being used is, is, is capable. There are advances being made in amplifiers and, and, and in the um, electronics and, 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 and the electrodes themselves to capture this higher uh, end of frequencies, but less so has been done, less progress has been made in, in this slower end. And so this is really what I want to focus on today is, is what's the added benefit of being able to record um, these direct current shifts and these ultra slow oscillations, um, and particularly in the context of epilepsy. And before I dive into the epilepsy, I, I, I just want to explain a bit more detail what one of these biomarkers is, and that's called a spreading depolarization. So, so what are spreading depolarizations and spreading depressions? Well, if you have um, a DC coupled recording system, what you can record is this depolarization here, which is recorded on one site. And if you have an electrode further away across the brain, you will see that this slowly propagates across. And so this is what's called a spreading depolarization. And it's associated with a suppression of this higher frequency activity. So this is you know, your activity in that typical um, LFP band of 0 0.1 up to 80 Hertz. So when you have one of these depolarizations, it shuts down um, um, higher activity suppression. And again, this spreading depression um, spreads slowly across the brain too. It's associated with other things. There are some quite complex changes 
to the neurovascular response, which we'll come to in more details. Um, but also you get big changes in the extracellular iron composition and changes in pH as this happens. These are not good things for the brain. Um, when they happen, um, there's a large amount of pro-inflammatory mediators released, um, reactive oxygen species, you get activation of um, um, proteins and enzymes that can break down the blood brain barrier. And you get quite a lot of cell swelling or even dendritic bleeding. These brain depolarizations have been observed when you've got the right technology to look at them in multiple neurological diseases. Um, they're thought to underline the aura associated with migraine. We now know um, that they're intrinsically involved with epilepsy but they're also found in other diseases like glioblastoma, traumatic brain injury, and probably most importantly, stroke. And it's very important to, to stress that the impact of one of these spread and depolarizations really does depend on the underlying meta metabolic conditions of the brain. So if you have a good um, blood flow, if you've got lots of oxygen and energy getting to the brain, then the brain can recover from one of these events within five to 10 minutes. However, if you have a metabolic um, challenge and you're not getting oxygen and energy to that area of the brain, then the consequences of one of these things could be really quite catastrophic. So how are they measured? Um, the gold standard way to electrophysiologically measure spread energy polarization hasn't changed in decades. It's essentially using a glass micropipette that has a silver silver chloride um, wire inside. And here's just an illustration that if you have two of these um, um, glass micropipettes at different distances across a rodent brain, you can induce a spread and depolarization, which you'll pick up on electrode one. This will slowly propagate to electrode two. And as I mentioned before, as this happens, you then get a spreading depression of that higher frequency activity. Now, um, this really is only suitable for, for doing studies in anesthetized um, animals. You're, you're going to lack spatial resolution because you're only going to be able to insert one or two, maybe three or four micro pipettes. So you won't have the mapping capabilities. But also, um, in terms of trying to do awake recordings, um, uh, sticking um, a lot of glass electrodes into the brain is, is not good. And clearly, there are translational issues here. But people do want to record these clinically. Um, uh, in particular, there's the COSBID group, who are, are very interested in trying to understand how spread and depolarizations impact on, on brain damage. And um, what they will do uh, for, for, for in the neurocritical care is um, if somebody comes in with a with a with a uh, a bad traumatic brain injury or, or a major stroke that may require decompression surgery, they'll try to um, put a, a strip of platinum iridium electrodes over there to try to map and pick up whether the people are having these spread depolarizations. And if they are, it's it's um, usually associated with far worse outcome. But even with DC coupled amplifiers it's very difficult to record these spreading depolarizations using metal-based electrodes. This is due to the intrinsic properties of the metals themselves. Um, they can form very unstable potentials. They can cause large DC drifts, which move the signal outside the range of the amplifier. And what's more, um, if, if we think about impedance as well, if you want to look at very small areas of the brain, you want a very high impedance electrode. And if you increase your impedance, that further distorts and attenuates the activity that you're able to record in this very slow regime. So even if you try to correct for some of these artifacts here, you'll see that using current technology, it's very difficult to accurately map out spring depolarizations using metal-based um, electrode arrays. So this is where the European um, graphene flagship um, stepped in a few years ago. And um, in particular, the um, material scientists and the electronic engineers at two Spanish institutes, uh, CNM and ICN2, that are both based in Barcelona, started to develop a graphene transistor array. And cut to the uh, long story short, these graphene transistor arrays are exceptionally well suited to recording these spread and depolarization events. So here you can see a long recording. You'll see that there's a negligible baseline drift also, there's actually no signal attenuation or distortion. And if we um, do a recording where we have a glass micropipette next to a graphene transistor array, then we can record with exactly the same fidelity, the waveform parameters, um, this, the, the spread and depolarization, indicating that our graphene technology is as good as the gold standard in the field at the moment. So what are graphene solution field effect transistors? 
They come in um, multiple shapes and sizes, and the two types that I'm going to explain today are either an epicortical device, which sits on the surface uh, above the dura, or an intracortical device, which goes through the layers of the cortex and into the underlying um, subcortical areas like that, the, the, the hippocampus. Um, now, they're based in a different kind of way. So normal electrodes will recall voltage. And in this case, what we're actually doing is detecting changes in current. So transistors are, are based on a three terminal device where you have a source and a drain, and you'll have this um, pristine graphene interface, which can contact directly with the brain. And because of its conductivity, electrical signals of the brain change the current, um, can modulate this graphene interface so that it changes the current that flows through the device. And what we're actually doing is detecting that change in current and using a transimpedance amplifier, we can then convert that change in current back into voltage. And this is a, a different way of recording electrical activity of the brain. So we tried to do most of the experiments in our lab in, in awake animals to um, uh, counteract the, um, any confounders that may occur using anesthesia. And we've developed over the years um, a head fixed preparation, which is based on the neurosent uh, tar system, where we can attach head bars to the animal. Uh, the animal is habituated to this, this frame. And this um, tray here is actually on a floating table. So when the animal starts to move, the tray moves around and it gives the animal the sensation that it's actually moving about. But in fact, it's not. It's the floor that's moving around it and its head is completely fixed. And this allows us to bring in lots of different um, tools. Um, we can bring in our, our epidural transistor arrays, our intracortical arrays, but it also allows us to combine this with other modalities such as optogenetic stimulation or wide field calcium imaging, all in an awake head fixed animal. And so the first proof of concept was, was how do these graphene transase um, um, look when we're trying to record seizure activity? So this is an epidural device. It's on the surface of the cortex. Um, it's in an awake head fixed animal, and we can inject a small amount of chemiconvulsant, which should trigger what we call this interictal spiking activity um, here, which you can see in black, these spikes. Eventually we have a seizure. And in, in the black here, you'll see at the end of the seizure, is a spread and depolarization. Now, this black trace is the signal that we're getting with our graphene transistor arrays. Um, if we then apply a small amount of this high pass filtering, which is typically done to um, AC coupled metal electrode recordings, you can see that we can pick up these intrictal spikes, we can pick up the seizure, but we completely miss the absence um, of this um, post seizure spread and depolarization, showing you immediately one of the advantages of having this wide bandwidth recordings um, enabled by the graphing technology. Now, recording chemiconvulsant induced seizures is very um, informative, it's very useful, it's a great way of validating technology. But all you're doing is applying chemiconvulsant to a normal brain. If you really want to understand epilepsy, you should be working with animals that have spontaneous seizures um, because um, the, the network properties um, and the way that the brain responds to glutamate and potassium are changed in, in chronically epileptic animals. So we're now moving away from using um, invoked um, seizures using chemiconvulsants to record in spontaneous seizures. And I'll show you a couple of examples here. So this now is a mouse model of a focal cortical dysplasia where we have um, uh, manipulated um, a, a, a gene that's expressed in the cortex. And when we do this, we can um, create animals that have spontaneous seizures. And likewise, if we place an epidural array on their brain in our, our, our head fixed um, preparation, you can record these intrictal spikes. We have the seizure and we have this very long spring depolarization, which we record here in black using our graphene transistors. And again, if we apply a small amount of high pass filtering to that signal to mimic the types of recording you would get with metal-based electrodes. Again, you can see the intrictal spikes, you can see the seizure, but all you see is this period of post-ictal depression. You have no idea really what's going on, whether there's a spread and depolarization or not. We're moving now to be um, able to do chronic um, long-term recordings in rats. And so here is an example where we have a rat model of focal neocortical epilepsy and we've chronically implanted a um, epidural device. And again, we're picking up spontaneous seizures now. And here again, please note that the scale bars are very different. 
but you can see here, um, this is the graphene transistor recordings. We have a seizure followed by a spring depolarization. And if we um, uh, do our trick of applying high pass filtering, we just see the seizure. So um, how is this going to help us um, understand um, epilepsy, having this ability to record the full um, um, bandwidth of brain signals um, that are occurring during epilepsy? And I'm splitting this into three different sections, uh, a section which I'm going to call pre-seizure, then uh, the actual transition to seizure, and then finally um, the seizure termination. So let's start with the pre-seizure. And to do this, I'm going to use a RAP model of absence epilepsy. So these are um, um, WAGR rats, which um, are a model of, of absence epilepsy. And here's a cage with all three of them having a, an absence seizure at the same time. And you can see that they're just kind of frozen, their head bobs. And, and this is quite com um, a, a good model of childhood absence epilepsy, where children just kind of zone out for a while and then they pop back in. And what happens with these is that you have what's called a spike in wave discharge, which um, is, is um, due to the circuitry between the thalamus and the somatosensory cortex um, becoming hyperexcitable at times. And we can um, insert one of our intracortical probes through the different layers of the cortex in, in the somatosensory area um, of these, these mice. And these black blitz here, these are those spike wave discharges. This is a very long recording. And what we've done is to superimpose on this in red is the very slow oscillation that is occurring with these, with these spike and wave discharges. So if we zoom into this in a little bit more detail, we can actually see here in yellow is that very slow oscillation. And you can see as this oscillation begins to pick up on the up phase of this, this is when we typically see a spike and wave discharge initiated in the cortex. And this is very evident um, when you're doing these experiments, you can visualize this in real time, you can track the DC level. And as soon as you see that DC level begin to rise, you can know that within a few seconds, the animal is gonna have an absent seizure. And so um, there's a very um, statistically significant um, correlation between the, the um, amplitude and phase of this infrasil oscillation and the, the spike and wave discharge. This means that by being able to record this infrasil oscillations, which are not typically done with metal-based electrodes for the reasons I outlined before, we might have a handle on being able to understand some of the mechanisms which push the brain into a susceptibility state that would allow it to transition into seizure. But also this technology could be very useful in terms of seizure prediction. If you're able to know in the seconds or minutes before whether you're gonna have a seizure, this could have a major impact um, on people with epilepsy and could be um, a very useful tool to incorporate into closed loop devices which are, are aimed at trying to stop the, the onset of seizures. And just before I move on, I'd like to um, just point out how stable this technology is in vivo. Um, the, there's a, an immense amount of work that went into this study. I'm just going to show you one quick figure here where um, we can um, record um, for up to 10 weeks, if not longer, um, from these animals once they've been implanted with one of these graphene um, devices. They're very biocompatible, they're very stable, um, um, which has um, a lot of appeal for the neuroscience community. So I'll now step towards the transition to seizure itself. Um, how, how can our devices help here? And what I'd like to do is introduce a term called an active DC shift. So what you'll see here in red is, is, is a high pass filtered seizure. And I think most people would, would argue that the seizure is starting with this vertical red line and the seizure finishes with this uh, vertical green line. Um, if we look at the very, very slow um, activity that is also occurring during this time point, we can see that this actually precedes the onset of the seizure. And this is what people term here in between the blue and the red vertical line as an active DC shift. Whereas the, um, here in between the, the red and the green line is what people refer to as a passive DC shift, which is thought to reflect the um, increase in extracellular potassium due to high frequency firing of the neurons. But what we're really interested in is, is, is on this active DC shift and the, electrical footprint of a, of a DC shift is very, very small. And that gives us the opportunity to localize where this activity is coming from. 
And again, we, we have an intracortical probe here just through a mouse hippocampus. And so these transistors are only 100 or 150 microns away from each other. And yet we're able to detect um, regional differences in that cortex as to where we're seeing the, um, the, the, the biggest change in these active TC shifts. They're very, very localized signals. And if you're wanting to, to know where sources and sinks, um, where activity is, is being localized, people will quite often perform a, a type of analysis which is called current source density analysis. And I just like to, again, to point out how beneficial it is to be able to have um, true DC coupled recordings when you're doing this type of analysis. So here you'll see from the superficial layers of the cortex all the way down to the deeper layers, uh, these are our, our different transistor recordings. And there's a seizure here followed by a spreading depolarization. And obviously there is a massive sink and source that is associated with that spreading depolarization. But if we focus in here at the start of the seizure, so this is just before the seizure starts, we can, this is the start of the seizure. You can see that there are layer specific um, additional sinks and sources that we can record in DC coupled mode that are absent um, if you record in an AC coupled um, way, indicating that again, if you really want to find out where the activity is starting, the localization, having um, accurate um, DC coupled recordings is important. So I'd now like to switch to seizure termination. And um, I've already introduced the concept of a post-seizure spreading depolarization. But why would this be um, important? Why, why would we want to understand that? Well, first of all, um, there's always a period of inactivity after a seizure. We call this post-dictal depression or post-seizure depression. And it can last for just a few seconds, or it can last minutes or even hours. And when it lasts a long time, um, and it can result in a, a, a complete flattening of the cortical EEG. This is called post-generalized EEG suppression. And this is um, a, a risk marker for people who unfortunately may um, succumb in, in the future to sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. So some people, unfortunately, after a seizure will die. And the mechanisms for this are not entirely known, but um, we're beginning to, to, to understand more and more about this. And so one of the things um, that people have, have shown um, in animal models that are susceptible to SUDEP is that at the end of a seizure, you may have one of these sprain depolarizations. And in these animals, at least, that sprain depolarization can end up invading the brainstem and closing down areas um, that are responsible for respiration and breathing. And that's um, one way in which we think um, these animals may um, submit to, to SUDEP. Clinically, though, what we think is happening is that um, you can have apnea, you can have a transient suppression of breathing, which is due to the seizure itself. But normally um, the brain arousal systems then kick in. They, they um, register the, the uh, hypercapnia and they start to stimulate. And that stimulation is important in re, re, re restoration of breathing and drive. And what we think may be happening is that the spreading depolarization is invading these arousal centers and shutting down what would normally re-kick state um, breathing um, after a seizure. So that's a, an active area of research at the moment. Just before I get to um, a, a real clinical impact, um, I'd like to just point out that for basic research purposes, um, the graphene transistors offer more advantages again over traditional metal-based electrodes. Um, in particular, that they're compatible with a wide range of commonly used imaging modalities. And I'll run through this in a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, an example of this would be um, calcium imaging. So um, in, in this example, what I'm showing you is that people can use uh, genetically encoded um, indicators of calcium, and um, they can have these um, be expressed in different types of neurons or cell types in the brain. And for example, when um, you have neuronal activity and action potential fires, um, you have opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium will come into the neuron. It'll bind to this um, indicator and change its fluorescence properties. Therefore, by monitoring the change in fluorescence, you can see which areas of the brain are active at any one time. And so we, we've applied this to, to um, the field of epilepsy. And here you'll see the cortex. This is the, the visual cortex. And you'll see the start of a seizure here. And this bright increase in fluorescence, this is, these are the neurons that are, are actively contributing to the seizure at the time. And you can see, interestingly, how 
that propagation jump to functionally connected areas in higher visual cortex before more, more um, diverse mechanisms of propagation kick in. Um, but we can also use this to look at the association between seizures and spreading tube polarizations. And so here again, in much faster speed, is um, a seizure that propagates across the brain. And at the end of this seizure, you'll see something different. You'll see the emergence of this ring of hyperexcitation that is followed by a complete silencing of all neuronal activity behind it. And this is um, an example of a, a, a spreading tube polarization. Now, we can do this in awake head fixed mice, and we can then put on um, our graphene transistor arrays. Because the graphene transistor arrays are completely transparent, we can actually look at the calcium signal directly underneath the graphene and therefore correlate um, um, the, the, the calcium signal with the electrographic signal that we are recording with our, our graphene transistor arrays. And this is an example. These are the, the calcium responses directly underneath the, the electrographic um, recording of the graphene. And of course, this would not at all be possible um, with, with um, metal-based electrode technology. Uh, in the interest of time, I might just um, slip forward this um, slide um, and show that it's compatible with other technologies. Um, so for example, if you're interested in, in blood flow, um, you can use a technique which um, uh, Serge um, introduced earlier, which is functional ultrasound. And we um, have a collaboration with Serge to show that our graphene transistors are compatible with, with, with that technology. But you could also use a, a technique called laser speckle contrast imaging. And here, what you can see is you can measure the blood flow through the, these vessels um, that are directly underneath the graphene transistor array. And as I mentioned at the start, there are some quite complex changes to the neurovascular response um, to a spread and depolarization that really depend on its underlying metabolic condition. You can either have a vasoconstriction, a vasoconstriction followed by a vasodilation, or just a vasodilation, uh, depending on, 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 on the metabolic state. And so here is just an example of where we think we're in this situation. You can see our, our transistor here. And as the spring depolarization goes across the brain, we see a reduction in blood flow in that area, which you will see in a second, um, comes back um, as, 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 as the depolarization finishes. Um, so it's, it's useful technology. So now I'll, in the last couple of minutes, I'll get onto the clinical applications. And the one that I'm going to focus on is the identification of a seizure onset zone. And why would we be interested in doing that? Well, there are a lot of people around the world with epilepsy. It's, it's the most common um, neurological disorder in adults. And unfortunately, about a third of those people um, do not respond adequately to anti-epileptic drugs. And therefore, there's a great need um, to try and treat this, this large population um, that, 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 that aren't suitable for anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, something that may be possible for some of these patients is epilepsy surgery where if you know where the seizures are coming from and it's in an area of the brain that is amenable for a surgeon to go in and cut it out, then that's what they will do. Um, and there are different ways in which you can try to identify where the seizures are coming from. The seamology of the seizures is useful. Usually there's some kind of um, um, MRI biomarker that will point you in the right direction. But really what the gold standard is to use electrographic recordings. If you can record um, using either EEG or stereo EEG or subdural grids, spontaneous seizures in these patients, then you can identify using those bio, uh, electrographic biomarkers where the seizures are coming from. And research over the last 10 years or so has shown that these high frequency oscillations at one end, especially if they're, they're these pathological high frequency oscillations, they, if you're able to cut out the area of the brain where you see these, that's usually associated with a good surgical outcome. But also, there are a few groups, um, in particular the group of Aikida in Japan, who are attempting to do um, DC-coupled recordings. And where they see these active DC shifts, or what they call ictal baseline shifts, because they have a much smaller electrical field, um, again, they think these are very useful for defining the seizure onset zone. And if they resect the areas where they see these active DC shifts, then again, the patients tend to do much better. And so this is just a, a little scheme of that where at the start I mentioned that the typical LFP band may be able to focus the seizures down to a relatively large area. But if you include, include the areas where you pick up these pathological high frequency oscillations, it gets a bit smaller. And if you include the area where it's, you've got these active TC shifts, 
you get a really quite small area. So the working hypothesis would be that if we can include accurate DC coupled recordings, surgical monitoring, this could result in less extensive yet much more effective surgical resections. Now, I've already gone through and shown you um, that we can record um, within micrometer scales these active DC shifts. Here's an example that using the same electrode, we can pick up high frequency oscillations on the interictal spikes that associate that preceded the seizure. And so in this animal, we've recorded several seizures. And if we look at the power of these high frequency oscillations on each of these transistors, we see that they peak around this layer. And if we look at the maximal size of the DC active DC shift, we see that it, uh, it zones in in this area. And so really in this particular animal, using those two biomarkers, we would assume that the seizures are, are originating from this very small area of the cortex, which is only a couple of hundred microns um, in, in size. So another advantage, if you're wanting to detect the seizure onset zone, would be to uh, be able to perform some focal neurostimulation. So some of the patients prior to surgery will have these SEEG electrodes implanted, but if they don't have a spontaneous seizure, then the surgeons will try to focally stimulate and the stimulation that they will give in normal brain shouldn't really elicit very much response. But if you're in epileptogenic tissue, then you can result in a discharge or even trigger a seizure itself. And as you heard, graphene microelectrodes can be made very highly porous, which allows them um, to inject a lot of charge current from a very small um, um, surface. Um, so we think that there are advantages here of trying to combine both the graphene transistor technology with the graphene stimulating technology. And so we have now, um, again, through our collaborators at ICN, um, the ability to, sorry, to have, um, sorry, um, devices where we can both stimulate and record. And this is just a, 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 an example where we can use the stimulating electrodes with titanic frequencies to actually induce a spray and depolarization, which we can then record with the transistor arrays, and we can map out that propagation. Um, we have the mouse models in which to test this. So in this case, what we're able to do is use a viral vector technology on a conditional mouse to um, create an epileptic focus in the cortex. So shown here in red is where the seizures are going to start from. We know that these animals are having spontaneous seizures. And if we focally stimulate in that red area, we can trigger epileptiform discharges. And so the idea really is that we'll end up with an array where not only can we record our active DC shifts, our high frequency oscillations, but we can then actually do spatial mapping to really detect in high detail where the epileptic area is coming from. And the final thing that would make this really, really um, clinically translatable would be if they're MRI compatible. And of course they are. So if, if this is an example from other people's literature, where if you take um, just a graphene fiber that's 75 diameters and a platinum iridium wire, which is 75 diameters, and you put this into an animal, put it in the MRI scan, this is what you see with a graphene fiber. This is the, what you see with a platinum iridium strip. You have massive artifact and shadow completely obscuring the area of the tissue where you're most interested in, where you think the, the seizures are coming from. And this is a, a continuous graphene fiber. Of course, our, our arrays have very, very small dots of graphene, but they're inside a polyimide shank. And so these are incredibly... Um, um, difficult actually to see an MRI. And we're actually working on a project where we can increase the MRI compatibility by adding fiducial markers. But this is a problem that we'd like to have. It's much easier to try to increase your, your MRI compatibility um, by adding small amounts of paramagnetic material than it is to have to deal with something like that. And so in summary, I'd like to say that um, due to their flexibility, transparency, that we can record current rather than voltage, they're biocompatible. Um, we think these graphene transistor arrays um, offer many advantages um, for, for preclinical and clinical neuroscience. Um, we have the ability to combine multimodal imaging with full bandwidth electrophysiology, and this allows us to look at the interactions between seizures, spread depolarizations, and also neurovascular coupling in disease relevant settings. And there are many clinical um, um, aspects which we're keen to explore. And, and I, I showed you some evidence where we think these could be useful, particularly in improving the seizure onset zone localization prior to surgical resection in people that have drug resistant epilepsy. There's an awful lot of people to thank. Um, these are my groups, um, the people who actually did the work at my labs in London and Manchester.
Um, these are the people in Barcelona who designed and make the, um, the transistors. The acquisition for most of the work I've showed today was, was from GTEC, um, but I also have other um, very important and valuable collaborators, including Costas Costarelius and obviously Serge Pacal. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Rob. I think that concludes our talks. Um, what I suggest, I checked uh, a, a few seconds ago, the chat, and we do not have any written uh, questions posted. So I hope uh, we will see anybody who is interested in asking a question or discussing with us, uh, joining us on the debate room. I believe the organizers have sent all, all three of you the link to the debate room. So uh, if we migrate over there, it will be great. So thank you all three very much for your talks and I will see you there in a few seconds.